Då kör vi. Vi har en, en tuff förmiddag framför oss med stora internationella gäster. And I'm proud to introduce so you can please take a place. Alda Terracciano. Alda Terracciano, you are honorary research associate at the University College London. Yes. And you are here to talk about an exploration of dynamic relationship between artistic practice and knowledge production in cultural heritage. And um, Alla is the international keynote speaker of today. Welcome. Thank you very much. Oh gosh, this technology. <laughs> Can you hear me properly? Yeah, okay, excellent. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this wonderful conference for your invitation um, for me to come and share with you my work and uh, hopefully some critical thinking about precisely the challenges and opportunities of co-production in heritage. I will read because otherwise, you know, I might lose track with all the things I want to say. So I hope you will not mind. Um, I will try to retain some eye contact <laughs> as much as possible. Um, so, as I said, what is important for me today is to focus on the relationship between artistic practice and knowledge production in the museum and heritage sector, particularly in relation to collective curatorial practices and digital co-creation. I will do this by closely analyzing how collaborations, which is at the core of my work, has been applied to the design and delivery of two digital arts and heritage projects. One aimed at critically engaging with the history of performing arts produced by people of the African diaspora in the UK, and the other at democratizing decision-making processes in heritage and possibly urban design. As part of my discussion today, I will also reflect on the way in which my critical perspective on issues of visibility, access and preservation of multiple heritage in the Western societies has led to a practice that reflects a shift from conceiving history as a static reproduction of the past to a process that molds it. My interest in the living, intangible heritage of culturally diverse communities in the UK has supported the creation of projects focused on public active engagement with issues such as, as I said, performing arts, everyday life, cultural practices, diversity, urban planning, but above all, cultural value. I will also consider how these digital interventions can actually contribute to a wider reflection on the distribution and communal ownership of information resources, on creative and active engagement with them, shaping an aesthetics of the intrinsically performativity of heritage and enhancing new research methodologies that can stimulate dynamic and democratic forms of knowledge production. But before I start delving more into the subject, it might be useful to very briefly introduce myself so that I can better contextualize my talk and my take on this matter. As you can see from this slide, I do wear a few hats, and this is sometimes problematic not only for my wardrobe, um, but what I came to realize, especially more recently, is that there is an advantage to this ubiquitous presence at different points of the cultural production chain, as this facilitates a perspective which is both critical and creative, while at the same time actively engaged with processes of transformation in society. And it is probably this last aspect 
that links up my artistic practice to the digital world, as there are challenges and opportunities for creative cultures in digital spaces, which potentially are able to contribute to the creation of more equitable heritage commons. In her essay titled The Digital Production Gap, The Divide and Web 2.0 Collide, the Berkeley University sociologist Jen, um, Jen Shreddy suggests that regardless of the expansion in user-generated content tools, such as blogs, video sharing, and other social media sites, which have made possible for ordinary people to create and distribute online content for the public to view, there are digital voices that are still missing especially if we look at mass cultural production of digital content through a production lens rather than existing consumption and participation frameworks. Using survey data of American adults, Shreddy points out to a class, race, gender-based gap amongst producers of online content, suggesting that the critical mechanism of this inequality is control of digital tools. Even among people who are already online, a digital production gap challenges theories that the internet creates an egalitarian public sphere. Instead, digital production inequality suggests that elite voices still dominate in the new digital commons. So, this is a crucial point, or at least it is for me as an artist. So, as remarked by Jeremy Silver, any existing digital spaces are walled gardens in the sense that they provide a closed software ecosystem in which the carrier or service provider has control over applications, conveniently restricting access to content of their choice. These so-called feudal arrangements, as he called them, by digital oligarchs are unsuitable for creative gardens. On the contrary, establishing diverse communities of practice for innovation requires discursive methods that move beyond simply networking creative individuals. Modeled on service performance, real digital innovation emerges from an ongoing process of exchanging one service for another and as a result of co-creation of value, which is the end product of knowledge exchange. So if we look at service science and service economy, in which the application of competencies, knowledge and skills is for the benefit of another entity, we will see that this model can be used to understand the process of knowledge transfer from one partner to another, which often takes place in collaborations, increasing motivation and productivity and contributing to find collective solutions. Now, the question is, how can technologies come in to support distributed creativity and innovation? And of course, we need to keep in mind that by their very nature, digital commons often leave very little scope for income generation and therefore need to be at, um, attracting public funding to avoid being left to the whims of the commercial sector. Another important issue to consider when creating material that aims um, to be accessible online is that most of the existing platforms which are widely used for communication and collaboration are social media spaces where immediacy is bargained um, for unwanted information totally irrelevant to the content created and promoted. For socially and politically engaged art projects, these are important critical issues, especially in consideration of data privacy, control and surveillance exercised by the corporate structures that own social media platforms. So, with all this in mind, what kind of hybrid spaces can we create that benefit from an alternative digital economy able to resist 
the harsh diktat of the market on the one hand and economic austerity on the other. What are the design considerations of a creative digital heritage commons? How can audience participation, collaboration and co-creation be facilitated in an online networked world? So, as I mentioned at the beginning, in order to look closer at these questions, I will zoom in two projects which developed um, in between 10 years distance from each other. The first will help me to point at the challenges and opportunities presented by collective curatorial practices in relation to existing archival resources. And the second, at digital co-creation with the aim of documenting and disseminating cultural, diverse, intangible heritage. Let's look at trading phases. So, Trading Faces uh, was launched at the end of 2008 as part of a wider project commemorating the 200th year anniversary of the parliamentary abolition of the transatlantic slave trade in Britain. My work as curator and creative director was the culmination of 15 years of research and professional involvement in the black theatre sector. For this project, I was um, in charge of curating an online exhibition for a consortium of partners, which included Future Histories, the organization which I run and was responsible for its delivery, Talawa Theatre Company, the National Archives, and the Victorian Albert Museum. The main focus of the online exhibition was to gain a deeper understanding of the slave trade and its abolition in the theatrical context, together with new information and knowledge of the achievements of people of African descent in British theatre. The key objectives of the exhibition were to demonstrate key periods in the history of black performance in relation to traditions and aesthetics originated in Africa, to explore the personal narratives of black abolitionists and the stories of new migrants in the UK against the backdrop of anti-slavery campaigns past and present, UK immigration policies and critical debates, and to offer the general public the possibility of submitting personal responses to the site in the forms of artwork if they wanted to. More generally, the platform was aimed at developing an accessible digital online research tool that would promote ongoing study on the subject. And this was achieved by including a number of links to online and offline resources external to those which had been researched for the project. In terms of methodology, Consultation formed an important part of the project planning and delivery. Focus groups were uh, conducted with lecturers, students, artists, community group representatives, academics and experts in the field. This was meant to open up the curatorial process and link it up to the African concept of orature which is a term coined by the Ugandan linguist, scholar, and uh, literary theorist, Pio Zirimo. The aim of the project was to bring center stage the performative nature of the material selected for digitization and establish a model of action that has the potential to innovate the field of digital humanities and critical heritage studies. This was a political act in the sense expressed by the poet and academic Michere Mugu in her African Orature and Human Rights, where she warns um, that the study of the old African popular arts should not be simply a way of returning to the source, but of exploring where to draw from in our struggle for human rights. So the point here was to resist the tendency of objectifying the past within rigid coordinates of time and space, and to involve black artists and activists in the interpretation and design process, privileging a synchronic rather than diachronic approach to history and memory. So I involved uh, a designer from Nigerian background, 
who developed key graphic elements of the platform, and a singer and composer who looked at the archival material and on that basis created new sound for the various sections of the exhibition. In, in a certain sense, what I came to realize was that actually these artistic collaborations not only influence the aesthetics of the platform, but also the way in which people would interact with it. In fact, the aesthetic legacy room, which is one of the sections of the online exhibition, requires a physical movement which is of ancestral African origin. The background of this section was designed as a parchment of several famous traditional fabrics from across West Africa. Mounted in the center of this parchment is an African divination bowl, which represents the cyclic worldview in which men, nature, and spirits cohabit. And so the kind of interaction between the web user, the icons, and the entire background is akin to a traditional game of Ayo, which is its Yoruba name, played by African people, not only in Africa, but also everywhere else in the world. So if the circle was an important element in terms of metaphorically re reconstructing the political, cultural, and ecstatic experience of artists of the African diaspora, the section representing the lines of development of African performing arts in the West had to be represented through a fragmented timeline. This visual fragmentation of the historical discourse on the transatlantic slave trade in Britain was conceived as a way to make overt the limits of the acquisition policies of many museums and national repositories. The historical discourse had to be located in between the objects populating the timeline, in the gaps, the absence of documents, in what had yet to be collected and catalogued. Hence the importance of creating a system in which the relationship between the object, which in the online exhibition had lost its materiality through digitization, the imagined performance and the reality that the object recreated in the audience's mind became central. Only the interaction between these three elements of the historical discourse would prevent the risk of fetishizing the history of slavery and emphasize, on the contrary, the value of subjectivity and cultural identity in relation to history making. As Stuart Hall remarked, in his critical essay, Cultural Identity and Diaspora, start quote, far from being grounded in a mere recovery of the past, which is waiting to be found, and which when found would secure our sense of ourselves into eternity, identities are the names we give to the different ways we are positioned by and position ourselves within the narratives of the past. This principle, which constituted the critical pillar of the exhibition, was also the raison d'etre of the voices section, which focused on the legacy of the slave trade and people's resistance to it. In order to contextualize the archive material, the online exhibition connected, as well as differentiated, historical slavery with contemporary forms of human trafficking. The comparative aim um, frame aimed to open up the topic to contemporary concerns, addressing issues of social justice and individual responsibility. This approach was tested through workshops with students and experts who warned against the risk of making simplistic equivalence between the experience of enslaved Africans and trafficked people in contemporary Britain. For this reason, Guidelines and essays were produced to help navigate in this section, where the narratives of black slaves from the past, Equiano and Mary Prince, were juxtaposed to those of trafficked people in present UK. The section offered critical perspectives on the pernicious continuity of two aspects of the transatlantic slave trade, economic exploitation and the infringement of human rights. Now, 
I don't think I can really go um, fully through all the challenges and the benefits of the partnerships which was established through this um, uh, consortium. But certainly one thing that is important to keep in mind when entering as an institution in relationship and in partnership with uh, an independent organization is the disparity of resources. So this is something incredibly important because this will help really, when taken on board from the very beginning of a project, to facilitate that process of knowledge transfer, which I mentioned at the very beginning. Whatever the case, the digital intervention in the archives of the VNA contributed to um, a reflection on the cultural belonging in relation to heritage and the use of technical, um, digital technologies to reflect the intrinsic performativity of heritage. So taking these lessons forward, 10 years later, I developed Mapping Memory Roots. Um, this is a project which um, saw a collaboration with the al Asaniya Moroccan Women's Project and Making Communities Work and Grow. And it's a project that explores the uh, tacit heritage of members of the Moroccan community in West London through an observation uh, of the underlying sociocultural values and practices that shape tangible and intangible heritage. The result of this uh, creative engagement with communities is a multi-sensory digital interface which aims at creating an experience that can craft deeper connections between people, everyday life and ancestral memories of the place. The challenge for this project was to create a digital space in which members of the community felt comfortable to contribute their own memories of their own intangible heritage. So, in collaboration with a human-computer interaction designer, I developed a community-led digital experience which would have the power to negotiate notions of identity, time, presence and transmission of cultural memories via a digital interface. We established to design appropriate interactions that use sensory modalities extended by digital technologies in order to augment the embodied experience and to invite the related communities to produce the exhibited content in order to strengthen the connections between the communities represented in the interface and those experiencing it. Looking at community participants as living repositories of tacit heritage, I started to investigate best solutions to facilitate the process and the flow of knowledge um, transfer, both within and outside the community. While a consultation process was taking place, um, I also began um, to think about a new design mechanism that would focus on the computationally extension of the haptic, olfactory and gustatory senses. The idea was to accustom people interacting with the interface with the practice of evoking ancestral memories through bodily experience and sensory stimulation. The goals were to identify appropriate ways to engage people with the process of surfacing, negotiating and reframing assumptions about other cultures, to gain a better understanding of what tactile, gustatory and olfactory experiences can be designed for and how they can provide space for intercultural exchange amongst researchers, participants and the general public and to design a tool that can stimulate the production of digital records from rich participants' input and collective insight, which can be later used. I used a participatory action research methodology, and so I designed and delivered five memory sessions um, involving a total of 43 people, the majority of Moroccan heritage, to explore the everyday life and living heritage. As part of the process, participants co-curated their contributions by choosing what they recorded to the camera in the form of testimonies that would later be shared in a multi-sensory digital interface. Now let's look at one of these memories. <laughs> <laughs> 
Every corner of Golden Road reminds me of my hometown in Morocco. And there's loads of aspects that, and then when they come together, it just creates a special environment. And the atmosphere is very special and it makes you feel at home. Yeah, London is home, but Golden Road is my real home. Because that's where I grew up. That's where I can go have lunch if I want. And go, all of my friends live local near Golden Road as well. So it's like, it's my spot. And most of the people around here are family as well. <clears throat> and if they move away, then it's just going to separate families, make it difficult for people to feel at home in a foreign country. I'm sorry, there must be a glitch with the video, but um, there is a second one which I think would be interesting to look at as well. It's the only genuine street left, because even Porto Bello Road is more and more commercial, you know. The situation is that more and more peop local people are leaving the area because it's becoming too expensive and uh, they build terrible things around uh, the, the, the corporations are like you know trying to make profit and this is a shame <laughs> so it would be great if we can go on actually they should increase this side of community not to kill it I promise on the digital interface you don't have the glitch. <laughs> so, um, so what I decided to do was to have these testimonies um, uploaded on a tablet through an augmented reality application which enables the playback of videos upon tracking a marker. The multisensory system is integrated within the tablet. It has been developed by the Politecnico di Milano and consists of a frame in which multisensory devices are hidden. Um, as I mentioned, the digital interface operates in conjunction with a physical map of Goulburn Road, representing the main buildings along the two sides. The map also includes objects in the forms of ephemera selected in collaboration with members of the community and positioned at the back of the road, each object representing a different sense for manual physical interaction by the audience. The aim is to represent the street as a living museum of cultural memes expressed in the form of artifacts, behaviors, smells, tastes, and narratives of citizens making up the area. So, for example, prayer beads um, invite audiences to engage with the haptic sense, to explore the meaning of this traditional cultural object. Hidden memes embodied in the objects then surface through gestural manipulation and, for example, the movement of the thumb passing through prayer beads to count religious recitations. Um, so to conclude and summarize, in this project, the integration and computational extension of the tactile gustatory and olfactory senses together with sound and vision underpins a design space aimed at facilitating a deeper understanding of the cultural patterns and everyday rituals of the community involved. The installation aims to be a space where socialization takes place, or even more provocatively, where a form of mixophilia to borrow a term uh, from Sigmund Baumann, can be temporarily established, offering visitors an experience of peaceful living with cultural difference, while enjoying sensorial stimulation. The collective curatorial practice with the Moroccan community to produce, select, and describe cultural artifacts populating the street map has created a direct connection and extension of the artist's vision to that of the participants and the wider audiences, opening up new forms of collaboration that can converge and interact with society at large. Touch, smell, and taste act as relays of memes, fostering intercultural exchange, enabling a deeper sense of identity and belonging, and facilitating the envisaging of utopian urban futures. Therefore, 
going back to Shreddy's analysis on the digital divide and its line of demarcations based on class, gender and race. The point is to facilitate the creation of a common space with tools that give users agency and flexibility to design their own digital heritage commons, pretty much as a public space would do for visitors. Hopefully, this project will evolve and we will develop an online platform for public engagement with asset heritage. And hopefully, the platform will then be useful not only to researchers but also to heritage specialists and the general public. Um, so, to leave space for questions, um, I would like to say thank you very much for your very kind attention and um, I'm open for any uh, feedback from you. Also, just to say, I have been asked to give you <laughs> A little task. This is my little task for um, the coffee break. If you could think about this question and come up with suggestions, please do send me um, anything you would like to share on my Twitter account, um, and the slip will be given to you um, before, the lunch, before the coffee break. Thank you very much. Thank you. Extremely interesting. You are really a thorough researcher. <laughs> I try to. <laughs> so, do we have any questions? Orian? Uh, the next project is actually to do something quite similar here in Gothenburg. And this time to look at um, the historical records kept in the National Archives uh, relating to a moment in Swedish history, which was uh, migration um, of Swedes um, to other parts of the world. And uh, look at ways in which these historical records can actually be contextualized within current waves of immigration to Sweden, um, but also looking at ways in which technology can help um, involving people outside the research sector with history, documents, archives, by using virtual reality. That's an idea. We are looking into that. Thanks. Are you looking for partners today? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Collaborations, shaking hands. Yeah. And I have a question, actually, about oh. that, because you are using, uh, you presented a lot of methodologies, and uh, you said one of the strengths was the disparity of resources. And how do you convince everyone to take part of this? Don't you scare them off with all those heavy methodology? I mean, it's a lot easier just to create, but you, you, uh, you need a lot of uh, research methodology to work in and collaborate with you, don't you? I think it helps. I think it helps to um, keep in mind what has worked for other people and build from that. It's important you know, not to reinvent the wheel. So to go back to projects and methodologies that have worked for <coughs> other collaborations and partnerships can help you to start off from a better ground. Um, as a researcher, but also as a heritage practitioner, you can look at best practice. And this can also uh, be a starting point in your conversation with um, small organizations. Because the whole point in this disparity of resources is, yes, we might you know, consider different financial resources, but then people have lots of knowledge. Mm. So how do you facilitate the flow of knowledge, the exchange? How do you manage to get people on board who might be less rich <laughs> in terms of you know, staff or uh, infrastructures, but have really rich information with them? So that is a crucial um, element, I think. Don't be scared. <laughs> Don't be scared. <laughs>
And you are staying here for the day? Yes, I am. So there will be plenty of time to talk with you privately. Yes, absolutely. And uh, then I'm saying thank you to you if, you, if there's no more question. And uh, since you took your time today, we've invested some money for kids oh. fleeing from war or escaping war, and uh, they will now be able to learn how to read and write. So, wonderful, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you.